welcome to In The Rising Podcast. My name is Bettina and this is the platform I talk about living a life that's in alignment with your hopes, your dreams, your goals, and your vision. Walking away, sometimes quickly and sometimes a little less quickly, away from things that bring you down, bring you away from everything that you have potential to create in your life. And I'm in an interview season right now, and I've had the wonderful opportunity to speak with Miranda O, oh, who is an author and fellow podcaster, and she shares some lessons, some red flags for her journey, and I'm excited for you to hear. So I'm super excited to speak with you today, Miranda, to have you on my podcast for In the Rising and you are calling, um, we and I are Zooming from Canada-US interaction today. So welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So you gave me um, a synopsis of something that happened to you in your earlier 20s and that you you definitely had a rising story. So one of those things is that you we're married to a person that um, definitely put you through some experiences. Are you, would you share that with us? Yeah, for sure. I'd be more than happy to. So um, like, let's flashback. I'm 32 now. So this was, oh my goodness, like 12 years ago. So it was another lifetime ago, but it's literally the, the, um, what's the word that I'm looking The lessons are still being learned. Let's mm-hmm. just say that. So <clears throat> I did get married to a, a, a gentleman from South Africa and, and we spent about four years with immigration, just kind of back and forth trying to get him into Canada. And um, that was a battle and every roadblock that you can imagine when it comes to immigration, we hit, whether it was racism, corruption, like losing of the passports or like forged documents. Like it was just nonsense after nonsense. And like, that should have been red flags at that point, but like, Hey, love does prevail, especially when you're young and in love and you have somebody with an accent, like it always is somebody with an accent at the end of the day. And um, and then he finally got here and I was like, yes, this is great. Like we get to have a little happily ever after we get to have a house with a white picket fence, you know, a couple kids and a dog like yeehaw. And um, (laughs) instead we got a cancer diagnosis Mm -hmm. and um, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, I mean, if you're going to get diagnosed with cancer, the doctor is like, this is the one you want to get because you can kind of treat yourself with it. You can, you can get a cure type thing and we're like oh that's well I was like yes that's great like high five but I self high fived because um my partner at that point just kind of curled up into a ball and said like I I'm I'm done like this is this is it and I'm like no it's not and he definitely just had a different perspective on it and so we fought with that for about a year and a bit and again everything that could go wrong went wrong the chemo that we got made it more angry and when we weren't on chemo for some reason it still flared as well and so it it was one thing after another just roadblock after roadblock after roadblock and everything we were fighting over and over and over just to get through it and one day and I'd like to say in quotations out of the blue he basically was like I'm out of here. Like I have my passport. I have a backpack and like adios. And when you look back 12 years later, 10 years later, five years later, you're like, man, it, it wasn't out of the blue. There was a lot of red flags, but you're in the heat of the moment. You're, you're basically treading water for your life. Just trying to stay afloat at that point for so many years that you don't see the red flags. And you just, or you see them and you ignore them. And that's definitely what I did over and time and time and time and over again. And so he got on a plane and he vanished. And that was, that was that, that was before goodness, my 22nd, 23rd birthday, somewhere in and around that. And I think just after my 25th birthday, I finally got the divorce certificate and it took years to get 
an actual divorce because we couldn't find him. And then when we did find him, he refused to get divorced. God knows why. I don't know. He had been gone for years at that point. He wasn't even in the continent anymore. Mm. And um, when I was, like I said, it was around my 25th birthday, I got the certificate and I was like, I can't believe I'm divorced. I'm 25. I lost everything financially. I lost myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything went into saving that marriage and it fell apart. And, um, during our story, I was like, man, this is going to be like a cool book. And then, then it got traumatic and I'm like, Ooh, this is going to be a dramatic book. (laughs) And, uh, it took a few years, but at, at some point when I was, you know, healing through it, I, I found an opportunity to write the series that I did. And, and that was a, a healing tool and a relatability tool and, and, and a, an opportunity for me to connect to people that are in certain situations, immigration, um, long distance relationships, cancer, illness, like, it, yeah, it was, it was, it turned well, to be a really cool opportunity. It covers a lot because you went through a lot. Yeah. Yeah. In a short period of time. I mean, still like it was five, seven years, but it like, that's, that's a short time in a lifetime, right. To go through all of that. And, um, writing the series definitely gave me an opportunity to connect to a lot of people that were going through similar things. And when you connect to people that are going through similar things and opportunities that you never expected happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have to back up because I know I'm not the only one is going to have this question. How did you meet if he's in South Africa and you're in Canada? Were you down there? Were you trapped? Like, how did you meet? <laughs> so I, um, when I was 18, I bought a business doing airbrush tattoos. So temporary mm-hmm. tattoos. And we would go from festival to festival. I had staff. It was so much fun. We would paint people's bodies from head to toe all summer long and um him and a friend actually came over to work with the fair so there's a big traveling carnival that travels through Canada and the U.S. and stops in like every town for a weekend or for a week or two weeks or whatever it is and so at the stop in my city um I was running my business and he was, you know, manhandling his ride. And I think I was going to the bathroom or something. And I turned a corner really quick and like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I ran face first into this guy. And, you know, like what a meet cute, you know, that's like picture perfect. And um, then it was, that was it. Like that was it, it for both of us for a long time. (laughs) And we're like, well, because we met that way, it just has to be it, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we went on for so many years. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it was quite, quite the little introduction story. (laughs) Well, it is. And that, that you had a temporary tattoo business was also very intriguing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. I've had many hats in this lifetime. That is so neat. But so you felt this connection to someone you clearly worked a long distance. He was going to come to Canada. What, what do you feel made you trust in the process? I mean, you loved him at that point and, and to really love and give is still a good thing. You know, we have to still see red flags, but to still appreciate that you could be in that process. Do you think you were always that person that could open their heart at that time? Or was this, um, do you feel it was something else? I definitely think that I went into it being the person that had her heart on her sleeve and was open to anything and open to everything. And that situation, when it ended, when he left, the healing part definitely closed me off. I definitely closed Mm -hmm. the doors after that for many, many years. And, and, and now again, I, I opened up with not conditions, but rules, rules that I set myself to and attributes and characteristics that I held myself responsible to, but also seeked out in a partner. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, I definitely went into it going like, I like, this is love. Like I, I've never felt this way before. So I'm going to just do everything I can to keep it and to make it work. And 
then, like I said, when it, when he left, I had given everything and I was left with nothing. So there was definitely lessons learned looking back and writing and, and going through all of that experience and saying, okay, like you can love and you can give and give and give and give and give, but somebody also has to give back. And that just wasn't happening. And that was a lesson that I learned the hard way, but it ended up working out in the long run. So it is. And so is. you, you made another really good point that you, you lot, you gave, but you also then lost your partner. You lost the expectation, the dream of your marriage, the picket fence, the dog, you, you know, he had yeah. this diagnosis of cancer. That is not what we expect to go through in a early twenties with a partner. Oh yeah. And then physically he packed up and left. In hindsight, we can always see it different, but at that moment, did you feel that you were, because it's also public, right? Friends, family, all, everyone sees that. Did you feel like you could see how, what other people were seeing at that moment? Or did you just still feel completely like lost? Oh, when he left and like, it was, it was over it was the most conflicting feeling I've ever had because there was still love. Um, but I was angry and I was utterly embarrassed when I walked into a room with my family, with my friends, the people that stood beside me when I fought with him to get him into the country, the people that stood beside us when he was super sick. And the people that stood there beside us weren't, weren't only just friends to say, Hey, how's it going? They were financially helping us. They were emotionally helping us. They would come and help clean the house. They would do the laundry. They would do the cooking. Like they were rocks. And I was so utterly embarrassed to be able to, to, ha to have to walk into a room and say like, yeah, he just, he left. Like he, obviously he didn't appreciate me. He didn't appreciate you and you've done everything. And, and, and I felt guilty that all these people did so much for me and it was for nothing at the end of the day. And of course, hindsight, looking at it now and, you know, down the road after that, that was definitely not the case that anybody in my life made me feel that way. It was me feeling that way only. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of raw, real emotion during that time that I really had to unpack, sit in for a long time process before being able to take the next step. Mm -hmm. um, that took years to, to really unpack and sit in and, and process. Well, it's a lot to unpack. It's a lot just in 10 minutes, you know, to, to, <laughs> to really, to, to think about everything because when he left, um, you know, there's a lot that their marriages fall apart or relationships, but when you're dating, someone leaves, it's not, you know, it's big, but when you're married, you can't just remarry. You have to separate <laughs> and to, to yeah. that he disappeared. It felt like he was dragging you into every day by not letting you go. How did you process that? I think it, it, like, it was like, I, I was fearful. I didn't know what to expect. You know, mm -hmm. like when, when he disappeared, he disappeared for, you know, a, a few weeks, a couple months. I can't quite remember. And, and then somehow, again, long time ago, somehow I ended up getting him on the phone and he was just very annoyed with me. And I'm like, hold on a minute. Like, I have been worried sick about you. You're somewhere in Africa. Like, what is going on? Like, are you coming back? You're not coming back. And he snapped at me. And I think I just cracked at that point. I was like, you know what? I am, I'm done. Like there, it was kind of like the last straw on the camel's back. Like uh, I snapped, I saw red, I said what I said, and I'm pretty sure I told him never to come back. And I probably said a whole bunch of other terrible things. And he had the audacity let's call it to be like you know what if I die when I die it's your fault and he hung up and I was like whoa and that was the last time we had spoken over the phone um the last time we actually had spoken and um, there's been you know a couple messages back and forth that have gone you know pa been passed along over the last decade but um it 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 was 
devastating. But I was so angry at that point that I had, I had no other choice, but to drop the anger. Like I I really had to work hard because I'm a, I'm a big believer that if you hold anger, it'll poison your body. And Mm -hmm. I was definitely at that point where I was, I was getting poisoned. I was getting terrible, terrible migraines that, you know, I would lose my vision. I get nauseous. I would was incapacitated. I was in bed more than I wasn't in bed. There was a very deep depression. There was a very deep anxiety. And, and I had to work with a medical team to get me out of that. And so the, the key was for me to really work on letting go of the anger and really work on letting go of the guilt and just accepting the fact that I can't love somebody to be happy. They have to be happy themselves and people are going to make their choices and I can't change that. And I shouldn't hold on to it if somebody makes their choices and I disagree with it. You know, we're all adults here. We have to proceed as adults and be respectful. And so I chose to forgive and move forward, drop the anger and really just focus on what I could do to find myself again Mm -hmm. and, and become a better person from it, you know, find the light at the end of the tunnel and rise above it. Yeah. And, and you did, because when you, one thing that we've learned as we learn, I've learned it more than once is you can't love someone enough into their own healing, right? Nope. And you cannot convince someone they're worthy, that life is beautiful, that the sun will shine tomorrow. You can't love someone enough. And it's yep. hard to see that continuously fall. It's a yes. hard lesson to learn. It is. It is. And it like, I think, especially as a young individual, um, it, it is tough because I mean, my parents are very much in love and were a very mm-hmm. wonderful example of, you know, of a good, strong marriage growing up. And that was definitely what I thought that I had. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, no, that's actually, it was so far off of that. And now it's like, okay, you know what? I will hold my standards to that. But at the end of the day, I am not my mother and I am not my father. I had to figure out what works best for me. Mm-hmm. And at the, and I had to be a whole human being. I had to love myself. I had to respect myself. And in order to be part of a good whole us or a good whole couple. Mm-hmm. And I, and that's what I searched out for. I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm not here to bring anybody up. Like you, you, you gotta be your own person. Now mm-hmm. you gotta be confident in yourself. Do we have moments? Yes. Do we lean on each other? Yes. But you gotta, you gotta know who you are. You gotta love yourself. You gotta respect yourself first and foremost, always, always, always. It's not selfish. It, it's it's the most important thing because then you can be a really good strong couple yeah it's I think more selfish to have to rely on someone else to pull you up oh um, hands down and it's exhausting eventually somebody's gonna break yeah yeah definitely and you said you were actually getting you, you said the word poison but you know when we are emotionally hurting we start to physically and i see that as a physical therapist you know we're told mm-hmm. not to not to assert not to to just treat the pain and the longer i'm a pt the more i realize that not every pain is physical in origin sometimes mm-hmm. it starts differently and that's part of where this podcast even came out well, can you expand a little bit on your own history with that oh my goodness gracious yeah like i the pain that I had experienced was downright terrifying. Like the migraines, I don't know if you've ever experienced migraines, but people that suffer from migraines know what I'm talking about. Like you feel like you were dying in that moment. And my doctor was giving me every single pill underneath the sun, trying to, to, to make it work. And I remember I had this little purse and I'd bring it everywhere with me and I would pop these pills. Anytime I felt a migraine onset, you know, I'm working at a car dealership at that point, And I have the weirdest side effects. It is springtime. I'm freezing cold. My hands are shaking and I'm typing with finger mittens on, but I'm drenched in sweat. And my coworkers are like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm fine. 
I'm fine. Just let me like, let me be what I need to do. You know, like the weirdest side effects. And then finally, after weeks of daily, terrible migraines, um, she's like, maybe they're psychological. I'm like, woman, you think I'm like, okay, come on now, doc, like help me through this. And so then she, she referred me to a psychotherapist and I had, I've seen two psychotherapists over the last 10 years. And really, I just go now for maintenance. I'm like, <laughs> like it's my yearly physical. Let's talk it out for an hour. Maybe like if we need to unpack something, I'll come back in a week or so. But, you know, I do this every year now and it, it is so, it's so good. Like, I think everybody deserves a therapist, but, you know, it helped me so much actually in my future because and I like everything is meant to happen for a reason because mm-hmm. again, bad, bad migraines with really crappy side effects. Fast forward like five years, I started getting really unexplained pelvic pain. And then later on was diagnosed with endometriosis and adenomyosis. And I fought for 18 months and I had to convince my medical team that it wasn't in my head. And so now I'm on the flip side. My first set of migraines was totally psychological. Now this pain that I'm experiencing is physical in origin. It's not psychological in origin. And I had, I literally sat down and I said, listen, I have been here before. I know when I have psychological pain, I even went to my psychotherapist. I'm like, okay, we just need to like cross this one off the task list like let's let's unpack this and see if it is psychological like is this pain in my head but it turns out that no it wasn't in my head it was actually real like I had lesions on my uterus and a whole bunch of other stuff so like okay girl you got yourself sorted so everything that I had went through because of this really has helped jump start anything that I have like any physical or psychological pain, I can pick it up that much quicker now because of it. So I'm super thankful for going through something like that early on in life. It just helps me later down in the road. Yeah. And to really be aware of what's what going on with your body, mind, body, soul is huh? huge. And, you know, you also said that you wrote about this, like where those, um, talk more, like where, where, if someone just sits there may not identify with every aspect of your story, but it's just like, that is me, Miranda. (laughs) How can I, how can I, you know, because we, we feel so isolated sometimes, like I'm the only one who feels like an idiot, you know, everyone saw this, but me, how can someone, um, like learn from you, what, what you've written, what you're doing? Oh goodness. You know, I, I knew that I wanted to share my story and don't get me wrong. Not everybody feels confident or feels like sharing their story and sharing their mistakes with the world is a way to heal. For me, it worked for my partner. Now (laughs) he's like, never, I would (laughs) never do that. And I'm like, you know what? That's okay. Because you deal with your trauma and your stress one way. I deal with it my way. I want to know that I'm not alone in things. And to relate to somebody that is a stranger that knows nothing about my past, knows has no bias about my my characteristics. They're just somebody that has experienced some kind of similar trauma or similar mm-hmm. feeling. When I started writing my books and kind of expressing everything that I had gone through, it was like reliving everything. So it was having like an outer body experience, you know, you go through it again, you're just trying to stay afloat. Then years later, you're going back and you're opening Pandora's box and you're writing these things out that you most, most, most of the time I forgot about certain things. Mm -hmm. I had to go and ask my family and friends about certain situations. I'm like, Hey, do you remember that new year's Eve? That was like really bad. Can you tell me about that? And then they would tell me, I'm like, Oh my gosh, that actually happened. Like no recollection. But then when you start to dive into it a little bit more, these feelings start to regurgitate and And then you're like, man, like that was actually a red flag that I had no idea. I didn't see. So now it's, you know, you kind of write that in your, in, you know, the back, the back pocket, or, you know, you put it up your sleeve for a rainy day. So if you ever go through that similar experience or similar feeling during a situation, you now have that memory that's packed or the lesson learned 
that's attached to that memory. So there was a lot of scenarios where I would write something about a scene, you know, I would write a scene, tell part of a chapter or a story. And I go, you know, in my books, my mantra and the title of my books is chin up tits out. And so my main character kept coaching herself through that. And that was my way to stop when I was writing pause and try to figure out the life lesson that was attached to that scenario now figuring out a life lesson in the heat of the moment I think almost near impossible but going back and reflecting is totally an opportunity to learn your life lesson or to realize a life lesson Mm -hmm. and then you learn it moving forward you practice it moving forward and so that was definitely a, a a successful route that I took when it came to writing my chin up tits out series. And, and then when it ended, I was like, Oh, this is great. You know, I got a new endometriosis diagnosis. Like I knew that because of the the drama and all that stuff that I dealt with, with my, that my health, I was like, this is another opportunity for me to go back, reflect and learn and practice and move forward and just continuously grow myself intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Cause I mean, everything pain can be physical, right? So it, it, it's, it's a constant learning tool for me and kind of always growing and moving forward. I never know. I never want to live the same day twice. Life is too short to do that. So um, it, it's just something that I have found successful in, in, in my journey. Again, my partner thinks I'm crazy and he would never do it but he he encourages me to do what I what I do and I encourage him to do what he does and that's why we work really well now Um, and then you also said you have a podcast yourself Yes, yes. Uh, Quill and Ink, a podcast for book lovers. So if you if you enjoy reading, but you also enjoy podcasts, listening to uh, me and my co-host Jenna Green, she's also a Canadian author. We tag team authors every week. We interview authors from around the world and learn about their craft, their process, their writing, their habits, their hobbies, make them relatable. We interview like international best-selling authors, USA Today best-selling authors. We interview musicians. It's it's so cool. And we figure out what makes them tick. They're mm-hmm. all regular people like you and I, mm-hmm. but we also, they also tell really cool stories. So we talk about how they get those done too. Right. Because it is a lot of work to write those books. And, you know, I, I, I want to pause because at least this is the last quote I heard is that, um, of the population wants to write a book. Only 3% actually write it and 1% actually publish it. So what you did is, um, you know, we say books, 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 I wrote a book, but, but what that is, what that entails and to pour your heart into that is huge because all of those words will make a difference for another person down the road. And I think one day we'll see who we made a difference for, but you don't <laughs> to see it all now. Is there any, any other things that you would like my listeners to know more about you or how to contact you? Because I will have your information um, listed below for the podcast. Well, my only advice to anybody is to always chin up, tits out, hold your head held high, stand tall. We're all going to have moments of insecurity. We're all going to have moments where we want to curl up and not come out of the dark place. But if you do and you keep that little mantra in your head or you fake it till you make it, whatever, whatever that mantra is, just find what clicks and find what works and always take a step forward. Because when you do get to that light, Ooh, it's like sweet. It's like a sweet cherry on top of a perfect milkshake. Um, and it's totally worth it. Mm-hmm. And if you want to get a hold of me, I am always down to make new friends, no matter where you are, no matter what your story is. It's it's I I, I love to connect with people. And the easiest way to get a hold of me is Instagram. So oh Miranda O, and that's like O H Miranda O H. Cause like, oh ha, ha Miranda O. <laughs> Well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. It was really a pleasure talking to you. I've learned a lot. I took some good notes. And so (laughs) thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I had an absolutely wonderful time with you. 
Well, this was absolutely an interesting conversation with Miranda. I loved her energy and her ability and willingness to look at her story. And anytime I am going further into a life lesson, I'm going to remember to keep my chin up and my tits out. I think I'm going to stick with that. But if you found this podcast beneficial to you or think this would be helpful for someone else, go ahead and share it. Leave a five-star review. It does so much to really put this in the hands and ears of someone that needs it. Someone that needs to know what a red flag is. Sometimes there are those little flags in our specialty drinks. And sometimes our entire neighborhood is just one big red flag. And until next time, let's keep building one another up.